Hello everyone, welcome to today's Water Cooler Chat, where we talk about all things live here, whether it's delegating, orchestrating, transcoding, developing, or just any general questions about the environment. We're here to answer questions and uh, get some feedback. Uh, today we do have an agenda ahead of us. We have uh, Ali with, uh, I believe it's called Tali, which is a, a Discord bot uh, powered by AI doing a Q&A session um, for the first half of the Water Cooler Chat, and then the second half will be followed by general uh, conversation around topics. So we'll start with the uh, introductions and we might as well do topics anyway just to get out of the way um, and then we can um, kind of come back around to the topics uh, in the second half. So we'll start with introductions. Uh, I've been, I'm Titan, been running the Titan Node Orchestrator since uh, 2021 and uh, yeah my topic today I guess is around um, stream distribution. I see it's been a, a bit a large topic for the last two weeks and um yeah might as well bring it up and we'll have a good topic uh, chat around that so um yeah that's mine uh chase media would you like to introduce yourself at a topic hi everyone it's chase from chase media here been running the node for just over one year now and no topics thank you just listening in thanks very good thank you for joining us frank would you like to introduce yourself at a topic Sure. Hi, I'm Frank. I'm running Ultima Ratio Orchestra as well since two years. And uh, I'm just listening to uh, tonight. Thanks. Very good. Thank you so much for joining us. Ben, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic? Hey, everyone. I'm Ben. I run the Authority Null Orchestrator. Been doing it since early November 2021. And no topics from my side. Very good. Thank you for joining us. Speedy Bird, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic? Hey, no topic for me. Um, Speedy Bird, been an O now for about six months. Um, going pretty smoothly and uh, looking forward to the demo and uh, discussion today. Very good. Thank you for joining us. For Koonsman, introduce yourself on a topic. Hey, Joey. Um, I run the For Koonsman node as well as the Community Arbitrum node. Um, only quick topic I had for today was talking about decentralizing the uh, community node. People are running their own nodes and would love for everyone to kind of jump in and help if they're willing. I think the uh, it doesn't look like the current grant that I received is going to continue. So got to figure out a way to reduce cost and still support the community or, you know, the node's going to have to go away. So kind of want to figure out how to keep it going. Very good. That's a great topic and uh, excited to get into that. Thank you for joining us for Koonsman. Papa Bear, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic? Um, sure. I am Papa Bear. been running the Solar Farm Orchestrator since um, July of uh, 2021. Um, no specific topic. Um, just kind of hanging out and uh, jump in where I can. Very good. Thank you for joining us. Zorro, introduce yourself on a topic. Zorro, are you with us? I cannot hear you, sir. Nope. Uh, you probably have to leave and come back. I'll let you do that. Varys, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Hey, all. I've been running the Rears in the Mares of Eve Orchestrator since four years now, and no specific topic from my side. Very good. Thank you for joining us. Zorro, are you back? Did your mic work? No, sir. I cannot hear you. Might have to try it again. I'll let you figure it out. Um, Ali, would you like to just introduce yourself real quick? But obviously we'll get into uh, into your topic uh, in full depth shortly here. But why don't you give us an introduction? Sure. My name's Ali. I'm the co-founder of Tally AI. And I'm excited to talk to you guys about uh, AI developer support. Very good. Thank you so much for joining us, Ali. Uh, Wolf froze we. I think that's how you say it. Would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm. Uh, my name is Tenzin. Uh, sorry for the the mouthful of the Discord name. Uh, and I am the other co-founder from Tali, and we are super excited to talk to you guys today about uh, you know how how we might be able to help you out. There you go, Tenzin. There you go, co-founder of Ali Tally, I should say. There you go. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your day to to come and do this. All right, we've got uh, got introductions done. Um, yeah, let's jump right into the Q&A session. So uh, I don't know who wants to, to start first, Ali or, or Tanzan. 
um, who would like to do a, 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 an overview of, of what you're working on and uh, what problem you're looking to solve? Sure, I don't mind jumping right in. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so first, just thank you for the opportunity to present here today. I'm really excited to share what we've been working on with the live peer community. If it goes well, um, maybe we'd like to apply for a grant. Um, so as I just said, uh, my name is Ali, and with my co-founder Tenzin, we started Tally AI. Tally is a Discord-based developer support bot that answers developer questions. Essentially, we're able to train a custom AI on the resor resources that are unique to the live peer ecosystem, like developer documentation, GitHub repositories, Slack and Discord messages, YouTube videos. We imagine a world where instead of digging through docs to try and get an answer, you can just talk to your docs via talking to Tally. Um, so wait, why are we doing this? Well, we've all been in a situation where we need some kind of technical support or help working on SDK. Uh, so you go to the Discord, you ask a question, the hopes that some good Samaritan or someone from the dev team can answer your question. And after you post your question, you just wait. And that wait is soul crushing because you probably have something you need to get done and you're facing a blocker. Uh, Tally aims to fix that. Uh, so we have a demo show off today, but um, I, before we just jump into that, I'd love to answer any questions uh, that the community might have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so a couple things to, to get us started. Um, I have a few questions um, and then we'll do, we'll do a, a, a demo. I believe we can do that in here. I have to make you um, a moderator, I believe. Uh oh, roles. Let me figure out how to do that. But in the meantime, um, I have two questions uh, just to get us going, and then I'm going to open up to the community. Um, also, do you want to put the link to your website in the chat to the side so that people can kind of see what they're what you're talking about uh, as they follow along? Um, sure. How do you train the AI and who configures what it trains on? Like you said, it does GitHub and YouTube. Like who decides what it gets trained on and what the resources are? Yeah, sure. Um, the way we train the AI is through creating documents. And each one of those documents is based off of a certain resource. So, for example, it can be based off of the FAQ on the live, live peer website or a transcript from a YouTube video. Uh, and then that document gets put into the model. Uh, and typically, uh, it's at the discretion of the ecosystem or the community that we're dealing with on what goes into that model. Okay, interesting. Very good. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to share your screen. You, I, do you have a share screen button on your uh, beside your camera and your mute button? Yeah, I do. Um, I can. I think I can try and click it. See if it. Yeah. Oh wow! It oh, actually works. That's. Uh, I'm surprised with how well that works. Great. Okay. Let's uh, let's follow along. Why don't you give us a demo? Oh, cool. All right. Um, so uh, we put this de demo together pretty quickly. Uh, so the answers may not be perfect. Uh, we might experience some bugs, like answers being cut off. Um, but we, the production version would be much more polished and accurate. This demo is really kind of a version one of Tally, which really excels at answering questions based on documentation. Our upcoming version two will be more advanced, capable of addressing more deep technical questions. You can think of version two as like a senior developer kind of thing. Um, let me share my screen and okay. Is everyone able to see that? Looks good. Yeah, it looks good. Cool. Yep. All right, I'm going to, okay, okay. So what I just switched over to is a private discord channel. I'll be dropping a link to this in just a moment because I want the community to participate. Um, but this discord channel, uh, kind of simulates what you'd expect. You can imagine there'd be a channel in the live peer discord that's named ask tally or something like that and you'd be able to go into that discord and um you'd be able to ask a question uh and the way you prompt tally to answer a question is you just start your question with at tally ai so you can say at tally AI, what is live peer and a new thread will be opened up and then tally will answer that question so we can go through some of these questions here 
uh, and then I'll drop a link in and you guys can get in here and uh, we can kind of beat this bot up and see what it comes up with. Uh, so this bot right now has been trained on the live peer documentation. Um, so let's see what kind of answers we're getting. You know, uh, is everyone able to, is, is the, is the sizing okay? Can you guys read it correctly? Yep. I, I can see it. Yeah, cool. good. All right. So like, what is live peer? Live peer is an open decentralized video stream protocol that enables developers to build applications, you know, yada, 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 pretty, fairly simple question. Um, we can kind of go down list here. As we get down the list, it becomes slightly more complicated. Uh, how can I get started using live peer? Uh, to get started using Live Peer, you need to create an API in Live Peer Studio. To do this, go to Live Peer Studio and click on Create API Key. Uh, you guys should all be familiar with this kind of process. Um, you know, how can I create an uh, API key for Live Peer? And then we get into more code specific questions. Um, and Tally's able to give code snippets uh, based on the documentation and the code base. So like, uh, how do I create a live peer.js client? Uh, it can give you an explanation, a small example of how to do that. How can I upload a video asset to live peer.js? This is another uh, example of able to give you uh, a snippet there. Uh, you'll notice there's a little bit of a bug here where the text is cut off. And just, just to add on top of that, uh, too, this is, you know, Dean, this is the one. It's kind of a one-off question answer type thing. The, the end game or end goal would be to be able to have a conversation as you, you're getting set up. So if I'm you know, a new developer, I come to build on live here, you know, the, the hardest part is you can go through the docs, you get the setup, and then you run into a bug. We want to be able to, so that you can post the bug in there and have a conversation back and forth, and the, the, the bot will actually have a memory of what you've talked about so that you can kind of iteratively problem solve through it. So you have kind of a fully functioning thing in a quarter of the time of uh, what it would normally take to kind of sift through the docs, like Ali said, ask questions in Discord and have you know a, a very responsive quote unquote senior developer that can guide you through the process. So would this, would, would, a, would one of the scraping kind of, um, I guess the, uh, the uh, resources would be the past history of Discord, like to chats in that have happened. One hundred percent. Yeah. 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 I could see a huge use for that because when I head over to new servers, one of the first things I do is I have a question that has probably been answered four hundred times in the Discord, so I try and use the search function. But unless you search kind of exact strings of what people are are asking. You, 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 might, you might miss it. And then what happens is you, you might find someone who did ask the same question, but then you actually have to dig through to find out what the answer was. And it might not have happened for like 20 messages. So you're just reading right. through other people's, like I, I do that quite frequently, which is, which is great because I don't want to have to ask and wait for someone to come back to me with an answer that they've answered 500 times. But sifting through you know, five years of Discord server texts is like also not something I want to do, right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And there, We've all been there. There's so much tribal knowledge that's kind of captured but lost in a sense uh, that's on Discord or even these community calls where people are asking questions. And these are all data sources that, um, you know, a chat or support bot should have access to so you can get, get that and, and not have to sift through years of things or, you know, be, be in the community for months on end before you're, you feel like you're up to speed. So I have just dropped a invite into the stage chat. Uh, and I invite everyone in the community to go in there, ask a question. Um, ideally, we would want to see where Tally is getting answers wrong. Yeah, here we go. I'm just trying to, um, I just asked it a question and it's not, it's not giving the right answer for the context of what I'm trying to, um, get the answer. Like I'm, I'm I guess giant right now, a video mining pool, not an ETH mining pool, right? 
<laughs> is, is it, uh, is it uh, trying to get you an ETH mining pool? Yeah, it's telling me to join ETH miner, but that that's not uh, that's not a uh, a uh, a video. That's not a live peer pool, right? That's a that's an Ethereum mining pool. So interesting. Um, so it's picked up on the wrong context around what I'm asking. So maybe I should re-ask it. Sorry. I wonder if there's something regarding uh, Ethereum mining pools somewhere in the live peer documentation, and it's it's referring to that. Yeah, yeah. So, because um, what it's I know in the documentation there's an entire page for dual mining, and so what it's probably picking up in is is literally the 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 how to mine the ETH part, but not the uh, let's see. I asked it a different a different question. How to join a live peer pool? Maybe that's more specific. But now it's not loading. Oh. And I'm disconnected from the internet. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Can anyone hear me? Hello. 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 Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. I literally yeah. just disconnected from the internet for like. A solid 10 seconds there so i don't know if anyone said anything yeah we were looking for you yeah um to join a live peer pool you need to install the go live peer client connect to the arbitrum network get started join command yeah i mean interesting it's not it's like kind of right but it's interesting yeah i'm sure yeah I'm and and I'm just going to say, um, sorry to cut you off, Titan. Um, like with um, uh, Authority Null's question about how do I set up an orchestrator, that's a, a extremely generic answer that would be pretty much no help to actually setting up an orchestrator. So um, I don't know if there's ways that, you know, we could go in and tell it's like, like this is what, if someone asks, asks this specific question, like <laughs> here's what you want to respond with. But um, I mean, I, I, I can tell that's, that that info's from um, the docs, but it's um, it, it doesn't really give you. A, I mean, I, I could never set one up from from those instructions right there. But maybe maybe if there was just a link at the bottom saying like, "Hey, I, I pulled this information from this resource. If you want the full resource, so that that that's a good idea, right? Because the the how to set up an orchestrator, it's taking you know very basic commands, but there's no much. There's no context around it, right? Like, you know, if you just scrolled up or scrolled down, you'd see like, oh, hey, you're you're missing the the beginning setup part, or or you know, where do you get the service address? What what is that, right? So, uh -huh. I wonder if almost just like giving these instructions and then maybe giving a link to the resource which it it's using primarily, and then like even if it came from like a YouTube video, it would be like, hey, like we think you you need to do this. Here's the snippet from, you know, 13 minutes and 20 seconds um, and, and, and on of when we found this information. And so it might give you more context around like, like if it gives you the correct answer, you could say, oh, hey, perfect. I got exactly what I'm looking for. Or if it's giving you an answer that's incomplete, you can say, oh, here's the, here's the YouTube video that starts at 13 minutes where it, it answers my question. I can just go watch it and... And uh, I can seek some more on myself, right? For myself. Mm -hmm. So something like I that. I think it would be, yeah, I think it would be very handy to know where this information that it's giving is coming from, like have a reference to it um, just for, for almost anything, just so you can, like you said, go get more context and also know, look and see, oh, and be like, oh, you know what? This is not what I was looking for. Um, so you can either ask the question again, maybe, or, um, or I don't know if there's a way to flag it that it, it didn't give you the answer you wanted, but um, yeah, because because I mean there's is... several different different ways to set up an orchestrator, and I know that there's different you know um, resources that can explain how to do that, but um, this is almost just a, like a real generic overview of how to do it. Um, uh -huh. Where I think most people asking this would probably want to actually know how to you know have more of a like a step by um, step by step. Um. This is really, really valuable feedback. Uh, is it possible that you, we could ask you guys to ask some more questions just to see what it comes up with, to see, um, you know, where are we getting it wrong? What do we need to work on possibly? Sure. 
What are some really annoying questions that people ask all the time in the live period discord? How much yeah. money can I make mining with my, <laughs> yeah. my 630 yeah, right. 90s? Please, somebody ask the question. Marco, where are you? Yeah. You had the best one. You had the best one uh, about that. Is, uh, please, someone. And, 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 yeah. and also, something to, to note, uh, and, and maybe <laughs> worth re asking the orchestrator question and you know asking for a step by step example, because what one thing I've noticed with these language models is if you ask a broad cut question, it'll, it'll come back with a broad answer. But if you, you know, ask it to provide detail or step by step or, you know, give snippets of code, it, it will, it will respond in kind to the query. Okay. I need to specify live peer here because it, it wasn't clear enough. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. So well, live peer. Oh, go ahead, Titan. Sorry. I, I asked how to delegate LPT, but it's going straight to the live peer client, uh, which like would not, it's, it's not not correct, but it's like not where I would send anybody who wants to delegate LPT, right? Yeah, it's almost like it needs to ask a follow-up question to say, as a delegator, do you want to know how to do that? Or as a, you know, like... Uh, um... Hmm. Uh, I'm yeah, I think having a hard time finding the the Discord that I was in. So um, I'm sorry. I'm just. Uh, I think uh, that's sort of the Discord. Um, no, I was in the Discord, but I, I don't know for some reason I must have clicked on something when I wasn't paying attention and jumped out of it. But I, I'll uh, I'll go back and, and just uh, click on the link again. Um, yeah, to to Papa Bear's point or Titan, I forget who said it, but um, some sort of multiple choice system would probably be. Uh, pretty awesome for for live peer in particular because there's information all over the place and like 75 percent of it is incorrect um and i think live peer specifically is going to be a really big challenge for a bot like this um because the information changes so fast and there's a lot of docs that aren't 100 percent up to date so it'll be really interesting to see how how it handles these sort of generic questions that we get a lot you know, I, and if it can go back to Discord history, it's like what there's a lot of a lot of times that questions have been answered um, multiple times, and each answer answer might be different depending on the year it was asked. So it'd be interesting to see how that works out. I feel like most of the questions that people are looking answers for are also not in the docs, right? Like right, like right, like you know, if you just if you just went ahead and scraped all my YouTube videos, you'd get a lot more directed pointed answers to questions that people had that like are more lot probably more common right like you know how much money will you make in gpus like that that doesn't get answered anywhere in the docs like why you know it's not really a documentation thing right um but but i made youtube videos about that so you know lots of, i think i think one of the issues we're having here is that the, the the amount of data it's being fed is actually pretty limited. Um, whereas I think if you mm -hmm. gave it something like Discord, YouTube, and and the docs, you'd probably get like probably better answers. Is my is my prediction? Because I'm I, live peer docs. Uh, I don't think are famous for being great documentation. Yeah, the docs are probably the least valuable resource. Um, and the Discord history is probably one of the most, um, but you have to like sort through what, what's right, what's wrong, and multiple answers to the same questions and all that. But the concept is great. Like, I feel like this would save a lot of people a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I was so interested in it uh, is because we get people coming in, um, not as much anymore with the whole bear market, but when things are really rocketing, and live peer, the, the the token was doing well. We had people coming in every day asking the same exact questions, um, and I think I've s sent like over four thousand messages, um, <laughs> just talking to people. So, you know, a bot that can do that for us would be sweet. Yeah, where can I buy LPT? There you go. That's a pretty common one, but I don't think that'll be in the docs, right? Oh, maybe. Coinbase cracking. Yeah, and if, if this is something you you know the community does want to fund, um, you know what well, one of the things we'd obviously ask is to provide us with all the resources where you think there'd be uh, the most value, um, so that we can ingest that and uh, kind of 
fine tune it to to make it um you know uh better for for questioning Ooh, what's the best gp for live here that's a good one it appears that the bot is no longer answering my questions did i did i offend it uh no i think that it's it's particular in the way you tag it if you if I don't know. There's, 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 so, there seems to be some nuance bug there. Um, gotcha. Let me type it out again. Let's see what happens. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's because I copied and pasted, I guess. Yeah, I think that's that's the issue. Oh, what? Really? If you paste it? Oh no. Yeah, I, 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 it does. Oh, I don't know. Okay. We need to play with that a little bit. <laughs> uh, it's not possible to provide an exact an answer to this question without more information. Oh, hey, this is a good answer. Uh, the amount of stake held. The of, oh. Additionally, the amount of money you can make with a 1030... 10.30... 10.30... 10.30... 10.30 is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> will depend on the performance of the GPUs. That's actually probably the most true answer that... Um, where did it get that answer? Yeah, that's... yeah, where did it get that? That's something I would type in a reply to someone in the Discord. Yeah. That, that is the most thought out answer to the most ridiculous question we ever get. Uh, I like it. Uh, it depends on... Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't think that's from the docs. Right? That, the key, it's not on there. Maybe Tali Which just became sentient. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, interesting. What are the best GPUs? I mean, what is the best GPU, I guess? It, it's just saying that, you know... See, I, I made an entire video on this, so if if that was a part of the, the, the data it took, I bet you'd come up with a better answer, but probably just from the docs. Is this pulling from GitHub as well, or is it just the docs? I think this is actually just the docs. Right. So Git, I believe um, Sundra has an entire GitHub, uh, I think, issue on all the performances on, on different, different GPUs. So if you even included the, the GitHub repository, it would probably pull a really good answer for that. But uh, How would the bot handle conflicting information, or do you just have to be really careful about what information you feed it? Um, or uh, train it on i mean so if there is conflicting information the answer might be conflicting you know it's it's kind of one of those things where if it's trash in you'll get trash out so we want to be really particular about what we put in the model um and you know i i, yeah. I recall you guys saying like okay our documents change quite often well we're going to implement this feature where uh we're essentially watching the documents and as soon as the documents get updated the model gets updated as well Oh, that's, that's and, actually and, awesome. Okay. And part of it is um, there are kind of multiple steps along the way. So if we're, you know, if we're parsing out information from the docs versus the GitHub repo and, and you know, so on and so forth, uh, that actually gets fed into a language model uh, based on the information that's been parsed out. So like, as this progresses, it'll, ha it'll become more efficient in synthesizing the right data and we can kind of wait, you know, um, some sources of data, say if the YouTube videos are quote unquote you know, higher quality, then we can kind of weight that as opposed to uh, part of the documentation. Uh, there's some there's some ways we can finagle it uh, as part of prompt engineering, but also how we ingest the documents to make sure that we get better answers. But it's uh, it's a work in progress. Yeah, by all means, it's um, it's it the the idea is phenomenal. I guess it just comes down to execution. the The idea, I, in my opinion, is is just unbelievably good. Um, yep. What? Agreed. What? Uh, so I'm going to start getting into other questions that, that I think of while we're doing this. Um, and some of them might make sense or not based on my general knowledge of AI learning. Um, so what model do you use for training, uh, training Tali? We use OpenAI's GPT 3.5 with custom embeddings. Great, that's wonderful. Um, yes. and, and what do you, uh, do you use? Who, I guess what service or how do you do the training for the model? 
Um, right now, it's a fairly manual process of gathering all the documentation, putting it into a notebook, scraping that information, creating indexes, and putting those indexes into the model, and then testing the answers. So, but and, just, and yeah, go ahead. Sorry to jump. No, go ahead. Unless my internet went Tenzin? back out. No, we'll cut like, out. Is that, is that my internet or your internet? I, th I think it's Tenzin's internet. Tenzin, can you try again? All right. I, I think I'm going to hop in here. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah Tenzin, uh, sound, like, sound like a uh, robot. Yeah, no. Um, so I, I, my, my question was around like, okay, so from my understanding, you need these uh, NVIDIA A100s usually provided by a cloud a provider uh, to do these, uh, to train these models, very intensive. Is that what you're doing? Are you using a provider to train these models or are you doing it using your own hardware? Uh, no, we're, you, we're doing it using our own hardware and embeddings is not really that CPU intensive uh, versus what you're talking about is more of a fine tuning kind of approach that would be pretty CPU intensive. Okay. Um, how long does it take to train something like this? Is it, does it, can you do it in a day? Can you do it in a couple hours? Does it take a week? Like what, uh, what's the time frame on, on training a new model for a new uh, project? Assuming that you have all the documentation compiled, you can, you can get something up and running in a couple hours. Okay, great. Now I have, um, I think I'm at like, let's see. 50 hours of YouTube video of talking about specifically live peer. How long would it take to train something like that? Um, the, the most difficult part of that would just be getting the transcripts. So if I was going to do that, what I would do is I would create a script that would go get all those YouTube videos and create transcripts based off of that. That would probably take an afternoon. Um, and then once those transcripts are put into a document, uh, it would just take a couple more hours to then train the model on that. So, you know, if you really put your back into it, you could probably take on a project like that in a day. Uh, then, of course, there would be a whole testing process and quality control process that would go after that. But just just getting a, a language model trained on those YouTube videos would probably get done in a day or so. But right. no promises on that. <laughs> yeah, I believe, I believe YouTube already has the transcriptions of every video. Um, cause there's a chat, there's a, uh, open AI plugin for Chrome where you can just go to, um, you can just go to, uh, the YouTube video that you want and it already has it pre-transcribed like two hour videos fully transcribed and you can hit one button and it makes a summary for you in like three seconds using chat GPT. So you can almost, just, that's pretty awesome. You can almost just integrate into those APIs where they have the transcriptions built already. Wonder. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, um, another question. I had. I had uh, yeah, go oh, ahead. Sorry. Go for it. No, no, you go. Oh no. Ask. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, what I wanted to request from the community is that, as we can see, the answers aren't where we want them to be. Um, and one of the most difficult things is knowing what the right answer is because we're not deep in the community. We don't. We're, we don't have the technical knowledge of the specifics around live here. So it'd be awesome if we could work with the community, generate a list of questions and what the right answers would be and use that as kind of a North star to help train the model and, um, you know, iterate what, on what we currently have. Yeah, there's definitely a few of us in here who can maybe hop on a call or something and, and go through and dig up questions and answers and you know, we only have to do it once, right? So we do it once, you guys feed the bot, and we don't have to worry about answering those questions again uh, unless the information needs to be updated. Right. Does does the model take into account, like, freshness or priority for, for answers? Like, you know, if there's a, a documentation that's dated um, two years ago and there's a new documentation... Uh, dated uh, one week ago and they have conflicting uh, answers to an a, a question 
will it show the newer one um, based on freshness or will there be a priority of the resource like the docs over GitHub over YouTube? So there's kind of a, a, fa- a waterfall of priorities. What would be more correct? Do you, do you have that in place or, or how, how do you look at doing that? Uh, it's something that we don't have currently implemented because we're still fairly early on. But it's something that we've definitely thought a lot about. Uh, how do you prioritize what documentation is best? Um, so, for example, if w- one thing that we've discussed with multiple clients is if there's a Discord message of someone asking a question and someone from the dev team or the moderators come and answer that question, then that answer should be prioritized. So we're thinking about a lot of scenarios like that, and we do hope to implement something like that on upcoming versions. Also, one last thing I want to say is we're going to have a direct feedback mechanism uh, that we hope to implement down the line, which is like a, 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 a yes or no, like a thumbs up, thumbs down if the answer was correct. If the answer was incorrect and the user thumbs down, it hits thumbs down, that's going to be taken into consideration by the model. Great. We have a chat. We have a question in chat from Troy. Troy says, um, "Are you guys going to add agents to this uh, so that it can perform tasks uh, for the user directly in Discord, like let's say Connect Wallet, and then delegate or stake to your specific orchestrator you choose?" Oh, that's a fantastic question. Uh, we don't currently have plans to implement agents, but we've been playing a lot with agents. I think. Once we get version two out the door and it's pretty solid, so like version two would be would have pretty sophisticated knowledge uh, at the level of like a senior developer. At that point, I think we'll implement agents on top of that. And you know, I guess the vision for that would be you'd be able just to tell it to do something, and then you would go be able to create whatever you asked it to do. Great. Um- you know, so if I deployed this on my Titan node server, which is a, a, a live peer pool, would would it be, would, do I have any customization around whether it's Ask Tali or like, could it be Ask Titan or like, could it be my own bot like, or, uh, or, or Tally AI or whatever it's called? What what kind of customizations are, are around that are you, are you looking to, to make? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. No one's ever asked us that before. Um, uh, I haven't even thought about it. To be honest with you, I don't have any problems with, uh, you know, triggering the bot using Ask Titan necessarily. Uh, It's definitely something I'd be open to. Uh, I I think that our principle is, you know, the bot should be configured in a way that is most helpful for the community, whatever that means. Right. Very good. Um, I've been, uh, Troy says I've been playing, uh, with auto GBT a lot, so I could see it being an awesome feature, uh, in his references to that, uh, to the tasks performed directly in discord. Yeah. Auto GBT is amazing. I think agents are going to be huge. It's going to change the way, uh, humans live their lives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what would you charge for a service like this? Um, is it? Per Discord size, is it per project size? Is it you know? Do you have a, a, a mo- an idea of what what this would look like in terms of cost for uh, a community? So most of our clients thus far have been Web three companies that offer grants. Um, so the grant size that we normally look for is you know between three to five thousand dollars, and that covers one year worth of hosting and support. Uh, we are looking into a month-to-month model, which would be about three hundred dollars a month. Um, but most of our clients like to go the grant route because that's the easier way for Web three companies to kind of execute. Um, as we kind of get bigger and we have more diverse set of clients, uh, I, I bet the month-to-month thing will really be more popular. Great. What about? Um... What about the uh, the usage of of this bot? Is it is it going to have it? Is it is it recommended to have its own channel where you would go to this channel and and so there you know it would handle lots of spam or is this supposed to be integrated into essentially all channels 
and um and you could you know in general chat you could just be asking you know like hey ask titan what how do i spin up a, a how do i connect to your pool node you know um is it a specific channel or is it across the entire discord most of the clients we've talked to want to keep it isolated to a channel the reason for that is that the knowledge starts to aggregate if you have a question like oftentimes we'll notice people like to go browse and see what other people ask so they can educate themselves so keeping that in a nice concise place seems to have a lot of value but on principle i don't see there why there'd be any reason why it couldn't be across the whole discord there you go does anyone else have any other questions It's going to be an interesting challenge to try and get all the correct information together and tailor the bot to be uh, accurate, you know, 99% of the time. I think that's the biggest, the biggest thing is making sure that we feed it the correct info and there's just so much information. Yeah, I think if this is something you guys are, you know, interesting in funding. Um, it will require um, some feedback from the community to make sure we are kind of going down the right path and providing the right answers. Because uh, that's going to be Ali's and our job is to make sure we refine it uh, so it, it's actually useful for, for the rest of the community. Great. Um, so, yeah, I have, I have a few questions more to keep going on this. Um, There's one in the chat as well if you haven't seen it. Just heads oh, up. Great. Um, can you tear up? Who is giving the information in information so it ranks higher in the model for the correct answers? Like, yeah, so that's not it's not something we currently have implemented, but it's definitely something we've thought about and we would like to implement. For example, prioritizing moderator answers over just any other community member, for example. Yeah, yeah, I think you mentioned that before. Yeah, Troy, he mentioned that uh, if it's from a live peer dev, then you're going to have a higher ranking of importance. Um, whereas if it's from just a, a regular member that's online, it'll be considered, but obviously underneath someone who's, who's in a more official capacity, which is, um, yeah, it's good. Um, how long have you guys been working on this? Um, it's been about a month and a half <laughs> and it's been, we've been flying by the seat of our pants. The response has been really, really great by the community. We've been learning a lot. So that month and a half feels like it's been like six months or something like that. It, you know, uh, time moves much quicker in the AI world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I definitely, uh, it's to be guaranteed is, uh, this is, you thought crypto was moving fast. Wait till you see how fast AI moves. Um, it's like really uh, insane. So, what is the end goal with Tally? Do you guys have a, a you know a big, hairy, audacious goal set out, or a mission statement that you'd like to share? Um, well, I haven't shared this publicly with anyone yet, but we've I've talked about this internally. I'd like to know what Tenzin thinks too. Um, but uh, I think that in the future, I'd like Tally to be competent enough to be a senior developer in an organization. Um, so that one constant resource that knows uh, all those small details that someone who'd be really senior would know. And eventually someone who can work in the organization be a team member. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's um, right now, the kind of V1 is surface level where we're kind of retrieving documents and whatnot based on a query. Um, ideally, this thing would have a understanding of how the, the code base interacts with each other. So, you know, if you're importing um, a, a package from over here, it understands what that package is doing and kind of has that integral baseline knowledge. So you can come in and be like, what, what's this error doing? They're saying, oh, well, this error is, is, is doing this, but that, that might impact this. And, you know, you might want to consider this. Um, so yeah, just a, a fully fledged, you know, context aware, um, AI, which is kind of, uh, true intelligence in my opinion. 
Yeah, so yeah, Sundra says, you know, he played with uh, auto GBT to try and make assistant that could execute commands. Uh, it's still not there, sadly. Um, yeah, like, I mean, this is all quite new stuff. You know, I've been working with uh, Copilot for coding and um, ChatGBT for, for coding as well. And, you know, you'll, you'll get these these answers that are like, correct like 95 percent of the way but then like there's a critical five percent that is that's like fundamentally wrong or just like maybe it's a hiccup and so that can set you back but it still makes the development process a lot faster right so you know as I, assuming that you guys are using the chat gbt model so you're using 3.5 and and you know when i don't know if four will become available publicly or or how that all is going to work but um, I assume that these models will also get better, and so you get a ride on the ride on ride that wave of of better AI systems as well. Is that kind of the the idea, or would you go down a, a path of of creating your own models in some way? Uh, I think that we definitely piggyback off of the great models that are out there. I think Ch ChatGPT is really just the beginning. Uh, we'll be in a completely different place in twelve months from now. Um, we actually already... sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll... No, go, no, go for it, Kenzin. Uh, oh, no, I was just going to say, like, I, I think, uh, eventually we, we, we would want to train our own models and have that kind of that nuance and, uh, contextual understanding because, uh, you know, when you rely on an, another service there, it is kind of a black box, but eventually we would want to have that kind of expertise in house where we're having PhDs tweaking on. Uh, on different things. So, you know, you can come in and ask questions and it has, you know, if you can say it doesn't know and it doesn't know and uh, can answer like the really deep nuanced questions. And sorry for cutting you off, Ollie. All, all good. Very cool. Uh, where, uh, go ahead, Papa. I see you're saying. Uh, I mean, this, this is just a, a little, just uh, not not super related, but, you know, there's also, there's a Tali dot AI which I um, came across when I was trying to do some research on this beforehand. I'm assuming you guys aren't related to them, and I'm just wondering, do you, are you concerned that you uh, may get confused with that um, product? It's a medical dictation um, AI um, software. Uh, I'm not particularly concerned that we'll get confused. Hopefully, <laughs> we'll provide enough value that people will kind of identify us. Um, yeah, it, th it threw me. So <laughs> it's like, maybe we're a medical the, company. The, yeah. Well, I just thought maybe it was like a different, uh, like it was based like that. Maybe that was like the first version. And then this was something else that you guys were working on. So, um, it did throw me, but you know, that could just be my, uh, <laughs> my intelligence level. But, uh, yeah. So I just, uh, so you just, so I just want to, I guess the question is, so you guys are not affiliated with them and it's just a coincidental, uh, similar name. No, yeah, we're not we're not affiliated with them. Okay. Sorry, uh, Titan, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. You know, I've, you know me, I've got questions that just keep coming sometimes. Um, so yeah, if anyone else wants to jump in, just feel free. Um, where are you guys based? Uh, right now, we're living in Mexico City, doing that nomad life. Um, but when we're not in Mexico city, um, I'm based out of Austin, Texas and, uh, Tenzin is homeless. I believe Tenzin, are you homeless? Uh, I, I live wherever I am. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. Very good. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's really great. Uh, that's the, probably the, uh, the best lifestyle, especially for something like this. Um, it's perfect. Um, are you guys raising capital? We're uh, looking to raise capital. Yeah, not actively right now. We want, before we raise capital, we want to make sure we have something that is of value and we're having a customer who we can serve. That's the most important thing. I think people get too obsessed with raising capital, but definitely something in the next quarter or uh you know q3 or q4 it's probably something that we're going to be thinking about so if anyone wants to throw us a massive check uh, we're happy to talk maybe yeah take my money please um yeah yeah but no it's an interesting question because this is something that i think um if you get a good product market fit um that would be an interesting avenue based on you know 
what you're trying to do and, and what your goals are and stuff. So just a, just a question. Um, how big is your team? Is it just you two right now? Yep. It's actually, we're three people, uh, two co- co-founders and one person on sales. It's a very small team. I like it. Um, so do you have any paying customers right now? Like, have you won any grants? Um, cause one of the things about st- bootstrapping this um say like if you applied for a live peer grant um and you got awarded some money you know the the people that are putting up the grant earlier you know quote unquote are are getting a less service because you're still building better product and so you know as it gets better um more and more people would be interested so is you know live peer might be an interesting um community to do this i have you know, I'm not on the, the grants committee, so I don't know whether this is something they would fund. But, um, you know, how many people, um, and you don't have to share this, of course, but how many other communities have shown interest? Have you won any grants? Or are you still just at phase zero? Like, you're still just building, uh, you know, most viable product, just like base layer, seeing if it works. Uh, so luckily, uh, we have won some grants. Uh, we, you know, I'm, I, I don't mind mentioning it here, but we haven't put out a p- press release or anything. We want to wait until we actually deliver it before we go too public. Uh, but we have won a grant from Lens uh, and Balancer. Um, those are two co- Web3 companies. Oh, very cool. Yeah, huge. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, so the you know sounds like you know as you gain traction and and do these type of uh, demos and stuff, you'll be looking to to increase in in scope and size and 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 quality and all these kinds of things. Um, oh, very good. What um I guess are you guys working on this on this full time? Is this a, a full time thing? Yeah, this is full time. This is all we're working on now. It's all we think about. It's the first thing I think about. Um. When I wake up, and the last thing I think about when I go to sleep. Very good. Um, Troy says, "How can I get in touch with you to add it to my DeFi project, Barn Bridge?" Uh, you can go to trytally.com, and there's a request form. And if you fill that out, we'll reach out to you within 48 hours, and we can get you up and running. That's amazing. Or we can set up a DM, whatever is faster for you or easier. Yeah, whatever is easier for you. Troy, go ahead and slide into those DMs. And uh, yeah, they'll be able to help you out. I like it. Uh, any other questions from the community? Uh, not really a question, but you know, if, when you get to the point where you're, you feel like you're offering the value and you have some examples and, and clients to, to sort of show, show how it works, um, and you're you're interested to raise capital, um, shoot me a DM. Uh, who said that? So I can just take note. Uh, ben, authority null. No. Okay, awesome. Yeah, shoot me a DM too, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I said, raise those monies. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, yeah, good comment, Ben. Of course, that's a that's a very exciting proposition. Um, what um i guess my question to to you guys is what could we do as a community to help um you mentioned you know feedback is going to be pretty key uh, what do you see the next steps being for us to help you um is it a, a private discord channel doing some testing is it uh you know what what would what would be your ideal setup to 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 quickly and effectively evolve um, well, I'd love to talk to someone who can be a decision maker on the grants committee so I can align with them and say, okay, um, you know, like, let's create a private channel. Let's create something that the community can interact with. And should we reach a certain threshold, um, then, you know, the live peer community would be comfortable giving us a grant just so we know, like we have something to aim at. Um, but more generally, we would love for you guys to interact with this. We would love for you, we, we would love for you guys to give us feedback. Um, so getting in contact with someone from the grants committee and getting someone who can kind of maybe take point on this or group of people who can take point on this. If we have questions or we need uh, feedback, that would be fantastic. 
Yeah, so I'll quickly make a comment on that. Um, the grass committee isn't known for their expedience. Um, I don't believe any of them are here. Um, and yeah, so it, they're basically notoriously slow um, and are not good at communication, it seems. So it, it, someone's on it, sorry. I'm just telling the truth. Um, but yeah, so you might put in a grant and like a month later might hear like a one-line sentence being like, hey, we're considering it. So um, I would say if you want immediate feedback, people from the community in this channel are probably best. Um, I know Ben um, is the one that actually put me in touch with you guys. Um, and Ben is super knowledgeable about uh, a lot of the questions that would be asked. He, I believe he won the Discord Champ uh, Award back for a 2022 uh, Orchestrator Award Ceremony. So, you know, He's uh, probably right up the alley. So big shout out to Ben for all his hard work being in the Discord. Um, yeah, Ben, thank you for getting us here. Yeah, of course, guys. I'm glad you were able to, to come in. Uh, one thing I'll say is if you do want to try and get in touch with the Grants Committee, I mean, first of all, good luck. Um, secondly, you can go to the Grants channel and tag hands. Um, as you can see, there are about a thousand people in there who are doing that um, and not getting... A response or just getting an emoji in in return um, but you can try and tag him and see if uh, you can get you can get like some sort of communication going but yeah they're the grants team changed recently um, and the new one is slower than the last one and the last one wasn't fast so just set your expectations for that do you guys have any uh, inside tips on how we can get their attention or um, you know it, 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 what what do they need on their end? Um, um, what are what are kind of the pressing things here on fire type things? So we can frame frame our solution around that. Yeah. So, I mean, usually step one for people is to create the proposal itself, um, and they will look at it at some point. Uh, generally, outlining outlining the grant in a sort of phase format. Like, here's what we've completed. Uh, here's what we'd like to do. Uh, here's how it can help your project. Um, this is what we're looking for. Um, you know, a little bit of how it works, but more about like breaking everything down in bullet points. You know, I've submitted uh, multiple people in here have submitted multiple grants and just do doing a lot of the work beforehand, which you guys have already. You have a working bot, um, and then outlining what's to come in the future. The grants team likes that, and it's usually responded pretty well. So I've posted oh, a link. I've posted a link in the chat there of um, the grants uh, uh, homepage, essentially, which is just a GitHub. So the README has a, a bunch of information, and then to submit for a grant, you just create an issue um, with what uh, Ben just talked about, and you can look at what other people how they're submitting theirs. And and I believe if you goes to if you go to closed grants, you can kind of see who's won and stuff. So. Um, yeah. That's where I would start. Okay, awesome. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah. So put 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 in your issue. Um go to the grants channel, tag hands in it, and um cross your fingers and um yeah, work with the the live peer community directly if you want like good feedback because Yeah, we're we're way more active in Discord um, than the core team is. Uh, Doug, who's one of the co-founders, he goes by a DOB, Dob. Uh, he's pretty active as well, or, or at least has been recently, um, as well as Hunter. Um, and you can always tag the core team, which is anyone with a green name in the Discord. Um, mm -hmm. But you know we're there every day, and you know they're obviously busy um, doing other stuff. Um, but yeah, definitely recommend checking out the closed grants. You're, the number you mentioned is well within the range of what the grants committee hands out. Um, they do even bigger grants too. I think I've seen up to like 30,000 maybe. I think LensTube had a grant and maybe Lens itself and they were pretty big. Um, so, you know, don't feel like you have to limit yourself on what you're asking for too much. But obviously like 50 to 100,000, that's a lot of money. So just keep a... Uh, Keep note of that. Sure. Um, so, yeah, we'll definitely take all those steps. And if you guys feel comfortable with it, I'd love just to reach out to Titan and to you, Ben, 
uh, if we have some more specific questions and we need some immediate feedback. Of course. Sure. I, I, you know, I would uh, maybe recommend, yeah, something like that. If, if, if we see that it's, this is gaining traction or whatever, we can also, we'll just include all the, like the or orchestrators that, I mean, just hop into the orchestrator channel. Like, honestly, that's all like, we're the most active people. Um, and lots of us can answer questions if you have them. So, um, yeah, we're all there. Any other questions for them um, before we wrap up the Q&A session? Nothing here. Great. Any other last comments, Ali? And um, what was it? I, I wrote it down. Tenzin. Tenzin, that's it. Uh, <laughs> uh, any last uh, comments or, or feedback questions you have for us um, before you before you wrap up? Uh, nothing specific on my end. I'm just really thankful for the opportunity to speak to you guys. I'm really thankful for the feedback and I hope we can build something that can serve this community well. Very good. I love it. Yeah. Just echo that. Cool. All right. What we'll, we'll do is we'll, we'll end the Q and a session here, but, uh, yeah, thanks for taking time of your day to, to come in and give this presentation. Yep. It was very interesting. And we hope that, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a benefit to the whole web three ecosystem, uh, we wish you luck on your journey, and yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. And uh, thanks, obviously, feel free to stick around for the last bit here. Um, yeah, so we'll just get we'll just hop into the regular uh, rest of the water cooler. I'll invite everyone back up to stage. Um, I know Fort Coonsman had a had a topic, but he left. So what I'll do is um, I'll just open it up to uh, to the the floor. Um, Basically, nobody had any topics. Uh, Four Coonsman's the only one that talked about decentralizing the community node. Um, he has gone, so I wish he didn't go, but he is for work. I recommended to him. It sounds like his community. It sounds like his grant is running out. So, does anyone else have any ideas around decentralizing a community node? Maybe we can have this conversation while he's gone. But um, you know, any ideas around that? I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't even know where to begin. I, it sounds like a good idea. Um, I, what by decentralizing, does he mean people running the ARB nodes uh, independently? And then like that all pulls into one API that can be accessed by anyone? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, because I'm pretty sure ARB nodes are hard to run. People in here right. have experience running ARB nodes. Are they hard to run? Um, from what I've heard, it's not that they're um, speedy. Just unmuted, so he probably has a better answer. But um, they're, it's not that it's super hard. But like, you need to constantly monitor the storage, at least. Um, from what, just from what I've been told, I've never run one, so I'll shut up. I mean, that's right. That's pretty much it. You got to be able to make sure you're staying up to speed with the current blocks, and that your disk is fast enough, and you can support the demand to turn it around. Um, and it's not a, it's not a um it's not a small footprint syncing with the chain yeah and it's also something that you really it needs to be reliable like we're going to have um nodes and applications running that need a, you know it needs to work 100% of the time and when it doesn't it causes disruptions to service so it a little a little sketchy to decentralize something like that but i mean live peer works so and the consensus is working on uh, decentralizing um Oh shoot! What is their service called for blocks on L1? Infura. Oh, this the sequencer. Infura. They're looking to decentralize that. Right. I think they use. I don't know some zk stuff as well. I'm not sure. Yeah. Interesting. I I I tested out a Pocket Network. Um, for those that don't know, Pocket Network is essentially like Web3 Infura. So it's just like endpoints and you pay for the endpoints in like a, a web three fashion. Um, I don't know if anyone's checked it out, but um, it seems pretty reliable. I got one of my nodes running on just a pocket endpoint and it runs has has zero downtime and is currently transcoding three streams. So um, I'm using the free tier right now and it works good, but I think those those services have done a lot better after Arbitrum Nitro. 
They used to get rate limited like crazy, but even the off-chain labs endpoint doesn't really get rate limited much anymore. Yeah. So, I mean... You need two different kinds of nodes, though. You need like a content node and just a discovery node, like one that's going to be syncing all the blocks, doing everything with the storage, and another set of nodes that can service API requests that would sync up with those uh, content nodes. So not everybody would have to have the disk to be able to provide effective, you know, ingress and API endpoints for everybody. But still, somebody has to run the backend disks. I feel like um, the way to subsidize for Koonsman node to keep it up and going is maybe for him to join Pocket Network and he could uh, serve up queries there and um, and earn some Pocket tokens or something like that. Um, but I don't think it's going to be very substantial. Yeah. And I took a look into Pocket and it seems really non-Web3 too. Like it's you have to pay by credit card. You can't pay with any crypto whatsoever. And uh, it's its own blockchain with a proof of stake market cap of 51 million. So it seemed like a insecure network that doesn't actually use crypto for any type of payment. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of like, wait, you guys just use Stripe for credit card payments? I was like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, why do you even have a blockchain? This doesn't make any sense. So, it's like Theta, right? It's the same. Yeah, same like concept. I was like, wait, I can't pay for your queries through crypto, and I'm like, well, that's weird. And then, and I was like, wait, how do I buy Pocket? And I'm like, can I? Is it just an ERC twenty? Like, no, it's where we're on blockchain. I'm like. Oh great! A fifty million dollar, completely separate blockchain proof of stake that I have to go to like QCoin dot com to buy. <laughs> it's like, um, so anyway, I was pretty put off by the project because of that. Um, I'd love to hear other people's feedback on what they think of uh, blockchain specific applications, which they have their own blockchains versus just using the security of. Ethereum or some sort of layer one that focuses on security. I don't know. Varies. Do you have an uh, opinion on this or speedy bird? Anyone? I think they're we'll go ahead. Speedy. Fund. We'll try to fund in whatever way they can. So, you know, creating your own token is certainly one way to do it. But I, I think as you're, question seems to be implying based on the context and i agree with it's you know it can't be a chain for the sake of a chain and a token and then you have bad tokenomics um yeah it, i think it's why so many people are sorry speed i didn't mean to interrupt you that's right i was just saying speaking of the elephant in the room <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> the life per system is sort of it's not its own chain but you know tokenomics needs some DLC. Okay, well, yeah. let's talk about to tokenomics. I mean, we just had a really large unstake of Livepeer. Has anyone seen that? Yes, another one. So, does anyone want to make some wild speculations? Um, I just want to say, I'm sorry, I just want to say that in, in the bear, everybody has a bone to pick with tokenomics. And then when it's bull season, everybody's happy with the tokenomics. <laughs> So, I don't know. I don't, I don't really. The tokenomics discussion is super subjective and I don't really think it's super valuable, to be honest. Speedy, any response to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, frankly, I think most tokenomics that most protocols offer are junk and they're, they're just there to subsidize the, their Ponzi development. So I, you know, the, the token has to have a purpose. And I mean, I agree, but like, would you argue that, like, I, I would argue that live peer token has a purpose and isn't necessarily only for Ponzi development. Um, but I, I, do agree, I do agree with what you're saying. What's live peer's purpose? What's the token's purpose? Uh, security of the network, because it prevents people from sending back transcoded data that's incorrect. 
there's some sort of economic well, punishment for it. I mean, I can be a transcoder for what five thousand dollars. Yeah, it's and not, it's well, not very secure. Oh well, oh yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, yeah, but it's securer than zero dollars. Like I, I wouldn't. But they were they were talking about removing that cap completely. But I don't think that's there for security necessarily. Um, and there. Go ahead. I I could be wrong, but couldn't there be a vote passed to like remove a an orc as well? Um, like, I think there is a slashing mechanism, but I don't think right. it's been used. It's not used yet, but I guess that would be it a good is, but utility. It is like if there's an orc, if there's a bad actor on the on the network, then the you know the orcs could get together and and try to pass a vote to get them taken off. What do you mean by taken off, though? Like not able to accept work. Well, I don't think we can. I don't think that's something that we can do. Um, if just move your network. stake and you just move your stake to a new orchestrator and away you go. So, yeah. yeah well, there's also, I mean, if, if um, it would, what uh, verification, um, it, when that's enabled, that should handle that um, that issue of if there's a, you know, a, an orc that's sending back bad material, they're going to get um, basically blacklisted from receiving new uh, new work. So, um, well, it's not in place right now. It is um, on the roadmap. But after all these years, it's not in place. Just goes to show you that security isn't really a high level concern at this point. I mean, it would be in the future. I would assume as you have more bees and more more demand, but we're not obviously there today. But at the moment, the incentive mechanism is is inflation, and that's what the tokenomics provides for. But I mean, if you're if you're a, like looking to invest in life peer and it's not a utility token. It's not a governance token. It's not, you know. It's defined it's, as a work token. Uh, yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that what really is, mean? What does that really? You get. It means you get paid in it. But okay. No. It's, what, ge- what gives it value? It's that you get. You get paid in some sort of other harder asset for work that's being done. So. It's right, but what does that look like for investors? Well, you get paid in ETH for owning LPT, right? Only if you're an orchestrator. No, if you're a delegator. Oh, right, 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 yeah. Right? So the benefit of owning LPT is that it pays you ETH, not that it pays you LPT. Well, that needs some work. So in that theory, you, you can now base cash flow based off of ETH generation, right? Similar to a stock certificate, right? You you buy a stock for the cash it spits off, not for the stock, right? Um, right, but then that goes into the whole demand side of things. I mean, we like the ETH payments are tiny, right? Well, like, sure. I mean, yeah, the the PE ratio of live peer is something like uh, two thousand, ten thousand PE. Like it's just like you know, whereas like. You know, Amazon is sitting around like 30, which is considered extremely high. You know, like the the, the, the PE ratio is non-existent for live peer because the demand isn't there. Right. So right? like what, I, what I'm hearing is the value proposition, the utility for live peers token is all future based. And in the present right now, it doesn't exist. Just like Tesla. Well, Tesla has a car. Yeah, but they don't pay dividends. So right now you buy a Tesla stock in the hopes that one day it'll pay you a dividend. In the meantime, they reinvest those earnings into growing the company so that it becomes more attractive. That's, that's the idea behind non-paying dividend stocks, right? So the, if you were to, which, you know, depending on who you ask, you know, live peer is supposedly or depends on what jurisdiction you're in is a security or not a security the thing is i have absolutely no, no problem with securities in fact securities is all i invest in because a security just simply means you have an expectation of profit right and i like things that have expectations of profit that's why i buy them um so in my mind live peer is great because it produces eth for work right 
um, the idea behind the inflation of live peer was supposed to be simply diluting people who don't stake. It wasn't ever supposed to be a return. It was just supposed to be people who don't contribute to the security of the network by delegating should slowly get diluted because they're not participating. And the people that do participate in the security of the network should increase in their um, dominance because they are actively helping um, provide value to the network, right? Why do you think um, LivePeer Inc. didn't implement a burn mechanism of some sort? Um, well, how, how would a burn mechanism work? I don't, I don't really know. To be honest, what? I just think it's it's scary to think that if we're below 50%, and especially this far below, we're just rapidly increasing the circulating supply, and it's never going to decrease unless someone sends some tokens to a null address. It just seems like a, a weird thing to overlook. Well, it's an inflationary I mean, token. It's, you know, it does right, never... But that's all it does. It, it never deflates. It's, so it's always losing value. And it's It's always inflating, yeah. Like right. the U.S. dollar, so, right? And we see how that went. I mean, <laughs> sure, the U.S. dollar is not going too well right now. Sure, um, but but the idea is you don't have to get diluted if you're participating in the security of the network. Like right. like if you if you have one percent of the network and you stake your tokens, you continue your one percent of the network. Um, hey, li listen, listen. I'm not defending this. This is just this is just the, uh, the rationale behind how this. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not works. for or against. I'm just trying to understand and get better no, context. I'm, I'm, I'm pro utility. I mean, governance tokens still have yet to prove that they work. See, at I, scale. I have a really hard time valuing or owning governance tokens. I don't. I don't understand right. their value at all. I like tokens that are producing or are based on work contribution. The security piece, I mean, that, that makes sense. But given the demand and supply in live peer, I'm not sure the security posturing really adds up much at this point. Interesting what you said, though, about trying to dilute out people who aren't actively staking uh, because you're not really contributing value and that that's a reasonable proposition i haven't heard that before the yeah whole inflation versus deflation i know it's in vogue to say deflationary money is superior to inflationary money um but i mean but but live peer is not trying to be money right live peer live peer is is more acting like a security where it's like you know it's kind of like you 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 when you delegate you're expecting returns of eth for work that's being done. I mean, work that is done on the network is done in ETH, not live peer. That's what makes it a work token. Whereas like Filecoin, you have to pay in Filecoin for the work on the network. So the currency of the network is the is the token, which gives it utility, right? So it's like a right. utility token. So live peer isn't a utility. It's like a, <laughs> I should probably not keep saying this security, but like, you know, in my mind, like, like if if the SEC came down on live peer and was like, "Yo, this seems like a security," like it probably fits all the it fits all of the Howey test stuff, right? Um, so it just comes down to you know how centralized is it, right? Um, but uh, live peer to me makes sense on its tokenomics. Um, it, I've spent a lot of time looking at other stuff, and I, I like the tokenomics of live peer. Probably the most. I think more protocols should adopt it. I think, I think it it makes sense. But like Pocket Network, for instance, or Theta, for instance, it's its own blockchain with its own validators that uses its own token for its own money. Like it's just something completely different and hard to interact with in the Web three community, and arguably not even decentralized because it doesn't use a good layer one. So. Yeah, I'm trying to wrap, and then and then so I'm trying to wrap my head around standalone blockchains that are application specific, and I'm also trying to wrap my head around governance tokens. Like you know, we got airdropped Arbitrum tokens, but they they 
it's not uh, there's nothing on the roadmap saying that you're ever going to benefit from these economically it, they're simply voting um and so i have a hard time understanding the value of those i think you gotta, the hope would be you there would be some proposals that you could vote on that may actually make the network more useful more secure more robust and that in turn rises all votes right and then the, the token is more useful i don't because then people more more people want to have the voting power and not necessarily think the token has utility but and these are, these are all stretches of imagination until one shows it working which is it i mean that's innovation it's fine give it a try i'm not saying all tokenomics are crap and life here has the worst tokenomics of them all that's certainly not what i'm saying right uh troy just a heads up you're hot miking my bad there we go. I mean, okay. So wait, wait. How did we get onto this conversation? Let's back up. What was the point of this? Uh, you you mentioned that there was a giant pull uh, on delegation of live peer, which is actually I'm curious. Do we know who did that? It was someone who was not transcoding. Um, that's all I know. Maybe Varies has done it. Was what, was it a delegator? Um, uh, unstaking from it from an orchestrator or was it the, i think uh, it was an orchestrator that wasn't um actively participating in the network uh and doug suggested that it could be related to the forum post but that's all speculation what forum post uh the one about uh distribution of streams because there was a lot of conversation there about um taking away the ability for you to come in with a bunch of stake and run a node and not transcode at all, not provide any value and just profit. Mm, maybe. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that was just Doug's feedback on that. Someone asked about it in uh, the delegating channel, I believe, and Doug responded. There you go. Well, yeah, I don't know who undelegated, but uh, I'm pretty, uh, I'm enjoying these inflationary rewards it's nuts right now dude it's great i'm just so it's crazy i'm so much more bullish it just makes me so much more excited i get that person's that person just forfeited their their ability to hold their percentage of the network now they're going to get diluted into us it's just like great we're participants we should be rewarded for participating we Make, should and yeah. they should not be rewarded for running a node without doing anything that adds value so yeah, it was it was several large um, unbonds from um, a, a, from from the same orchestrator, which um, doesn't have a name, but they ends in zero uh, D one. Um, so uh, it's I, I haven't really looked into it other than just kind of peeking at it now. Um, but yeah, there were there were um, I mean it was it was some significant unbonding um, from multiple. Uh, Delegators that again, I don't know if those were externally from the orchestrator or um, who they were, but it was multiple accounts. Do some grayscale uh, FUD. <laughs> <laughs> it's all whenever there's a big unbonding, it's like, oh man, grayscale. Yeah, it's a uh, crazy. Uh, for Coons, when you're back, uh, do you want to chat about your, your, uh, your uh, topic? I see you had to go, but are you back already? I cannot hear you if you're trying to speak. Yep, no dice. No dice. Probably need to leave and come back. Discord. The amazing place where, for one reason, just some, for whatever reason, this is the only bug in the entire program. Oh man, you should see Twitter spaces. It's hilarious. So buggy. Is it? Oh yeah. <laughs> Got these like Twitter spaces with like you know, ten thousand people listening and people can't hear each other and speakers have to leave and come back. It's just funny. Like auto auto muting and stuff. Jeez. Come on, Elon. Am I an audible now? Oh, uh, there you are. Yes. Okay. All right. So you, your topic was about decentralizing the note community node. We we kinda touched about it while you were gone, but um Tell us what you mean by decentralizing the community node. Well, okay. I 
say decentralizing. It's not really decentralizing, but I mean, here's the deal. I'd like to keep the service going, but the grant committee is not going to continue, like continue supporting it moving forward. I'm paying for all of these resources um, globally to host Arbitrum nodes. So if there are community members that are you know willing to jump in, and a few have already reached out, um, I'd I'd like to just have this kind of completely community. Like if there's somebody out in the EU that's got a node running, well, let's just connect. If they're willing, connect it to the the pool of nodes so I can spin down the other EU node. You know, just trying to make it affordable. And if there's people that are already running Arbitrum nodes and want to help support to keep this going, like that that's my goal. Are you concerned about the reliability of, of having a bunch of people's nodes sort of be the backbone of the community node? Well, part of the reason I want to, like, it's not just a free for all. Um, I want to work with a select few people, test it out, see if it's working. I mean, the thing is, if, if nodes have issues, like, they'd all still be running under my, like, central load balancer, right? And there are health checks in place. So if there are stability issues, if they get behind on block syncing, the node goes down, like it will take their node out of the pool, just like it does now with the nodes I'm running. Um, so actually, the more people that could, you know, connect, the, the better, right? And I can test, um, I've got ways to um, do load testing on each of the nodes and making sure that it's going to work, but I, I don't really see it working much differently than my current setup. Just other people are running their own nodes, and as long as they stay in sync, um, the load balancer will keep sending requests to them. So, um, I, I've recently looked into Pocket Network, um, and have you done any research into it? I started, yeah, I'm trying to set up a node right now. I'm running into some issues trying to troubleshoot. Just haven't had time, but yes. Yeah, so that might be an interesting way to help monetize uh, the nodes that you do have. I suspect they won't have, um, it won't produce the revenue required that you were getting from the community node. Um, I suspect it's going to be pretty low, but I've been using, uh, yeah, pocket, no pocket network for one of my endpoints and it seems to be pretty reliable. Um, so that's, that's been a good experience so far. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, might be, I see, uh, Nico put up this, this link for node pilot. Um, but it looks like it's built on top of pocket. So I think it's, a, it's the same thing. Um, Looks yeah, so I mean, Pocket is essentially doing what I'm talking about doing right now, just in a more centralized. Well, I don't want to say it's decentralized, but like in a more trustless manner. Um, honestly, it'd be cool at some point if you know we've got people running nodes on different chains that want to connect and we could establish our own community of different, uh, you know nodes to support you know if people are, are using it and make it very cheap to use i don't know it's just a thought but um i'd like to keep the project going just because it's fun to run and support and can't afford to do it without help from the community at this point so and you're right on the the revenue from pocket like i've done so i've looked into it more um they actually post stuff about average returns per node and stuff like that and on arbitrum it's like the average node is only earning um one uh what was it <sighs> is it their own token that they earn yeah one pot one pocket token per day which is like four cents so it's <laughs> <laughs> worth it so <laughs> it's worth you know having it up like if we're already self-sufficient and we want to also point those nodes to the pocket network like sure that's just extra revenue um, and maybe it increases over time with reliability. I'm not hundred percent sure how that works, but yeah. I'm kind of confused around pocket and it, it, they're their own blockchain, right? So yes. like, and they're a proof of stake blockchain with $51 million market cap. So like what, what's the, you know, economic security of pocket tokens? Um, 
you're well right now they have it's slashing right so if you don't return a response correctly like your node if your node misbehaves your tokens get slashed right hmm yeah interesting um i just yeah i'm i'm using one of their um it was like super easy to spin up you get essentially one node for free um uh for live peer so yeah i've got one going there and it seems to be pretty reliable and uh okay. Yeah. I mean, frankly, there may not be, there's probably not even a need for the community node anymore. It's just kind of one of those things I want to keep going. So. Right. And when, when you say there's no need, do you think that people are moving away from the community node or people have good re, uh, alternatives? Like I know that Arbitrum is becoming more and more um, prolific in, in on for as a chain that people want to use. So, you know, there's probably more support for it. Whereas I think back in the day, like it was very hard to get reliable Arbitrum nodes. Um, do you think that time has passed? And so maybe there's less need for it or what's your opinion on that? I, I think hearing everybody, you know, here talk about what they're using. I know several people, uh, the guys I'm working with on the video miner crew, like are using multiple public endpoints with failover using the, uh, titles uh cloud player worker process like i i don't know the need for a dedicated node it seems like a lot of people are embracing the whole failover concept using other public nodes and the, frankly the public nodes are working well now right right what what is your overhead for each node and how many nodes do you have currently four nodes um two in the u.s two in the eu cost about 500 us a month mm. going it's expensive yeah that is quite expensive it's the storage space it requires so much storage that and cloud storage is not cheap uh, what um how much storage i mean right now all the nodes have two terabytes well um one of them has a little less but i mean the, the database is growing really fast so, yeah, I mean, in order to keep it scalable, you've got to use a service like, um, you know, Hetzner has a good service where you, you can scale, um, you know, block storage and attack, attach it to your servers up to 10 terabytes. It's just, it's not cheap. That's the thing. It's scalable. It's just as the database grows, it will become more and more expensive. What are, what are the hardware requirements for it? Like, um, you know, I just built a new tower. Um, it's got kind of the latest motherboard, latest CPU. Um something like 32 gigs of ram like it's it's pretty decent is that beefy enough for an arb node or is it uh, or you got to go even heavier than that that's, that's probably beefy enough how many cores is that uh it's like the it's uh it's like the latest i5 so how many cores oh, yeah. it's like a, yeah. eight cores or something like that 12 cores that would be plenty big enough to support a big chunk of traffic um again the big thing is um high speed storage right so on i actually do host one of the servers um at home and i've got you know two terabyte nvme drive on it which that works really well i think i also have an i5 um in it but i never have any issues with it it always can support the traffic um did really well under the load balance or uh load test you so. can get you can get these 4 terabyte ssds for pretty good price now um would that how long would that last you for an arb node i bought one for my eth node and um yeah it seems to work really great now that's another thing it's kind of unclear at the moment um so right now here let me let me pull up in my dashboard and i can tell you because hey if you go to the um uh, like node resource usage uh, Grafana dashboard that I put together, you can see the um, current disk space usage. So on the, the drives, like EU1 and EU3 have two terabyte drives. They are 50% full at the moment. So well, that's not too bad. Yeah. So, I mean, but within how long have we been on Arbitrum? You know, 18 months. Um, 
it's already grown to that terabyte size. And it seems that as, as more Arbitrum adoption takes place, the growth rate is, is kind of scaling exponentially. So, um, yeah, at some point, I, I don't know, Arbitrum's going to have to figure out how to, uh, you know, be more storage efficient. <laughs> well, like ETH has that problem, but ETH has been pruning, right? So like everyone's, I think Geth just did a big prune where like dropped it back down to 600 gigabytes, something like that. So like, but it got up to like 1.5. Like my my uh, Aragon node got is past 1.6 terabytes. And it's growing at 16 gigabytes a week. Does uh, does ZK have the same issue, or is it completely different? Because they run, um, they they batch and prove transactions. Well, not prove, but they batch them off chain, right? And then they send them to, um, I think it's the prover node that uh, looks at the um, uh, computational integrity statement, and then that uh, says, okay, this is legit, and it just sends it off to. Um, I forget. I did a deep dive on this recently, but I don't know. Like, if you're running a node on a zk roll up, does do they have storage issues? Because if not, that's a huge, a huge pro. Yeah, I believe zk uh, don't store all the computation on chain. They just store the proof. Right. So you okay. Get yeah. So. You get to what throw away they? like a ton of the um, all the storage of what happened. So, yeah, from my understanding, zk is definitely going to be better than optimistic rollups, but I just 100%. don't know. I just don't know um, how good they are yet. I've I've been dabbling around on zk era, but there's just not a lot of projects on there, so it's pretty unfun. Um, check out. Starkware, um, they have a lot of projects running on their system, like a ton. Um, and they're releasing StarkNet soon, which is their um, ZK network. Um, they don't actually, they don't like calling it ZK. They call it validity rollups. Um, but they're massive and they have a lot of momentum and when they uh, when they launch Starknet, it's going to be pretty badass. I don't know. I don't know who's going to stick with optimistic rollups when zk's are out and about. Uh, especially if they can decentralize the sequencers and the uh, provers, or I think it's the provers. Whatever runs off chain um, is going to be centralized initially because they just have no way for people to run them. But I, I'm I'm kind of worried for optimistic rollups. What do you do when your competitor is just leagues better than you in every way? What's the what's the benefit of going with optimistic? Like optimistic was always like kind of a band aid stepping stone, though, mm. right? Like we needed scalability when we needed it. Um, but like I definitely think that a lot of these will have to switch over. I Arbitrum does seem to have like a roadmap around it, though. Okay, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, I like, guess they'll have to adapt or they'll just get left behind. Yeah, like a lot of projects were waiting yeah. for ZK rollups to happen, but like Live Peer specifically, because we had to call reward every day, was like, we can't wait. Like, the pain is too great. Like, we, ha we have to move. And Arbitrum was the only, like, option. So, yeah, I mean, as these Layer 2s come out, they keep getting better and better and, like, that was that was on the road. That was the question I had for uh, Doug way back in the day. Was you know, are we planning on staying here? And he's like, well, the nice thing is the way we've done it with upgradable contracts and and moving to layer two. Like we can we can switch to another layer two um, quite easily. Like um, it it obviously would be a big challenge, and we'd have to make sure it's worth it. But um, to jump from um, this layer two to another layer two, like a ZK layer would be um, actually less difficult than the ETH to layer two jump. So, yeah, 
a lot of people can definitely move chain move move layers as they become more mature but the graph the graph is moving to layer to arbitrum now which i found that very interesting oh really yeah yeah they just started their migration this month they're just on eth mainnet oh god why would they do that to their people i know it's brutal um i went to go stake like a hundred dollars in the graph and it was like thirty dollar transaction fee and i was like oh not this again yikes so yeah they they're moving to uh, arbitrum which i thought that was an interesting move um for a project of that is quite sophisticated they're a quite sophisticated team um and yeah they decided to go with arbitrum cool so that makes me pretty bullish in arbitrum in general but um yeah i mean i might spin up an arbitrum node seems like a lot of work though for almost no reward so i'm not i'm not confident um i'd probably do it just to set it up on pocket network and like get involved with that thing but i don't know what to think of pocket seems interesting i like what they're doing i don't like their chain per se i think they should just be on a layer two but this is my opinion um so for Koonsman, if if uh, you don't get any support, what's your uh, what's your wind down date? Um, you know, how long are you going to sustain this before you just you know shut mm-hmm. it down? Probably going to be June. Okay, good to know. Yep, um, I, I'll make an announcement before just completely shutting off. But uh, yeah, it seems like there's there's interest. So, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Plus, I'm, I'm my node locally, so at least for anybody in the U.S., it, it could still be an option. I'm just, I'm not going to be um, paying for the cloud resources anymore. Yeah, which makes sense. Hosting something in the cloud in general for crypto seems like an oxymoron. Yeah, it's just at this point, it's the most economical way to do it. (laughs) So. There we go. Cool. All right. Any other, any last comments on that topic? Or I think we've we've got that one set up. Basically, you're going to be winding it down if people want to contribute their resources, uh, doing self-hosting on their servers and just contribute. And if we get a, global distribution of them that you know the community node lives on um otherwise basically um uh, it'll disband that's it cool um so well you've got the u.s figured out I, essentially what are you looking for then just the eu for for a node and do you need I'm- four nodes like what is the purpose of having four versus you know one for each continent well, uh, having failover in each, you know, availability zone, I, I think has been important. The nodes do go down. Um, I mean, it happens. Um, or sometimes there will be, I'm not exactly sure what causes it, but they will either go through a pruning or something that you know, you'll see a spike in CPU resources. And there's a, you know, a period of time where it does not continue sinking blocks for a few minutes and then it picks back up. Um, as far as I can tell, that's just normal operation of the node. But like when that happens, I want to be able to push requests off to a different node. So while it does not happen super often, uh, the failovers do occur. There we go. So would you say having one node in that one location with a failover in a different continent is not good enough? Like... Do you think that you need that distribution? The only problem there is that the it's the timeout period um, for live peer, right? Like you start sending requests across the globe, and you get a lot of those context deadline exceeded errors just because the node is not responding fast enough. Okay, can that now, be can that be adjusted in the saw in in live peer to say, hey, I'll wait longer for this information? I don't actually know. I haven't looked into that. 
because maybe maybe the answer is we're willing to accept an endpoint based in the US we increase the timeout frequencies and and um and that doesn't affect transcoding right because they it, it, you know maybe you can say well I'll wait up to twice as long or three times as long or however long it takes um that we think is applicable and then you can say well we don't need uh we only need one one in the US and a failover in the US and and that's it right yeah, actually, that, that could work. We should look into that. We should look into. I don't. I don't see the the benefit of having globally distributed um, RPC endpoints for for Arbitrum because I don't, I don't think it's not like we're sending live video where you know that distance matters because of heavy traffic. Um, these are pretty small packets, are they not? They they are no, and that makes a ton of sense. Um, something I have personally not had time to look into. So if anybody knows the answer to that question, um, please speak up. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, let's... Uh... Oh, um, very I'm many. running a U ARP node, so based on the U server, um, and my US nodes are connected to that, and there's like no problem at all. I think LivePeer has already a pretty generous, like, um, timeout threshold baked in. So sometimes I'm even able to to upgrade the node without any downtime. Well, I think part of it, like there's extra hops involved with with the community node currently, right? Because, you know, the, the nodes reach out to a load balancer, load balancer directs them to the ARB node. There's a There's an authentication layer that it hits first, right? So basically the software I wrote is an authentication, you know, API that sits on top of the ARB node. So it has to make the request, authenticate the key, relay that request to the ARB node, and then send it back. So I, I think, like, I'm already adding extra la latency into the process is part of the issue. Yeah, right. That makes sense. And then I think also part of the issue comes in <clears throat> when you get to the West Coast, um, if you're, like, if you're going from, like, EU to, like, L.A., is quite a bit further than uh, EU to New York, and then also like Singapore can. Th those are the areas where we see more. I see more of the um, errors popping up, or is like the uh, in LA and in Singapore because they tend to be further from where the people have nodes set up. I don't know who in Singapore is using the node, if if anybody. But like I know, I've heard from Striker a few times on this. Um, I've had a couple DMs on Telegram where it's like. It, there, there seem to be more errors, people trying to use it in Singapore, just because it's, I, I, I do believe it's just latency is the issue. I'm sure, I, I mean, that would be my guess, but um, but yeah, I, I think that um, it seems to be on the, you know, the West Coast and in uh, Singapore is where, where I was seeing them when, um, I mean, I've been, I, I'm using, I actually am using the public node right now and it, it, it's been really solid, so. Um, um, so yeah, so I, I I can't speak to what's currently going on, but in the past I, I would notice more errors in those uh, regions. All right, well let's do a little more research into what the timeout is, and maybe you know if it is generous already, like Vary says, maybe. Maybe it's something that is uh, we can adjust, uh, add a flag for it, or maybe there's um, there's um, a, a great a deeper problem that you're experiencing for Koonsman. Um, it would be worth looking into. Um, so yeah, because then maybe it would be worth just having winding down three of the nodes that are in the cloud and fixing that problem, and then and then. Maybe that overhead was unnecessary to begin with, or maybe it wasn't at the time. It was. It's been a, a wonderful service. I very, I, I very much thank you for it. Um, I've been able to run my entire pool off it, so it's been great. But yeah, maybe it's worth uh, trimming the fat and finding out uh, if we could lower that resource. Absolutely. Very cool. Um, yeah, sounds good. Um, what I'll do is I'll invite you to. I'll I'll DM you with uh with maybe some next steps. It'll be good to go. Good to go there. Um cool. 
Uh, we got about 10 minutes left. Um, did we want to talk about stream distribution? Uh, I know there was a big uh, forum thread on it. Um, yeah. Does anyone want to take a whack at, at that conversation? We I, It would have been good for last week's conversation. Um, but we didn't have last week because we were uh, it was Easter, Easter Monday. So we decided to skip it. Um, but yeah, does anyone want to make any comments on kind of that ju stream distribution uh, forum talk that was happening? Well, I think it's been brought up in multiple water cooler chats and pretty much everything you can say about it has been said. That's kind of my take. Yeah, I think this has been a topic for quite a while. Um, and it's not an easy topic to handle because uh, depending on where you are, it's, a, it's just different, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm not caught up in on the whole thread, but maybe I'll just go back and read it. I guess, do we want to just leave it at that? We'll just leave it, we'll hit continue the conversation in the thread where it's more formal and well thought out. I mean, I, I personally think so. I think some, there have been some really smart comments and possible solutions addressed by like Thal and Nico. Um, and not sure if I'm missing any others, but I think it's a great, a great thread. Um, there's some noise in it, some of it from me, um, just because I don't know how to do the whole technical part of it. But like people are proposing really good solutions and discussion there. So I'm, I'm happy it exists. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, open dialogue, open o o uh, discourse, open source. You know, these are the type of con uh, conversations that make it uh, make the, the system more robust and better. So well-rounded. Um, one last comment I want to make about the Chappella upgrade uh, that happened just the just last week. So big shout out to the ETH team for uh, for doing the uh, the Chappella upgrade. So uh, ETH withdrawals are now enabled, making Ethereum even more of an attractive asset. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to be on the Ethereum ecosystem. So it's a it's a pretty pretty cool upgrade that just happened. Man, ETH did really really well with that news. And that ability to withdraw. Yeah, yeah, and uh, completely went in the face of my thesis when uh, the beacon chain started. My whole theory was after the merge and after withdrawals would be enabled, um, yeah, the price of ETH would just absolutely collapse. And That's uh, what a lot of people thought, yeah. And it uh, did the inverse, um, which is why I also don't trust myself as a trader. I uh, stay away from trading at all costs. <laughs> Yeah, because everything I do, it does the opposite. So, um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't trade because, uh, yeah, I would have gotten that bet wrong. I would have gotten probably every bet wrong that I've could have foreseen, and uh, yeah. So I'm glad that I'm more of a a hodler now. So for me, I like it. Uh, pretty bullish on the ecosystem, even though. Uh, things are pretty bearish out there still. Um, yeah, the sentiment is still pretty, uh, pretty negative. Yeah. There you go. See what happens. A lot of people calling for a massive correction right now. Yeah, great. Can't wait. Buy more. Right. Um, cool. Uh, any other topics, questions, comments before we, uh, yeah, finish up this water cooler chat? Uh um, just a quick follow up to um, the unbonding that happened earlier. I just did some math on it while, while um, everyone was chatting. Um, so it was it was 532 um, LPT or roughly 532 LPT or sorry 532,000 LPT that was unstaked from uh, from one orchestrator um, from nine different accounts. Um, don't really have much more than that, but I at least want to put a number to it just to give a, an idea and. Um, I mean, that one orchestrator alone went from receiving um, in total, you know, 275 LPT a day to like 15 LPT a day. So um, that's why we've got, um, everyone's getting a bunch more LPT to uh, 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 daily. So um, we're all splitting that. Um, so for, there's a, there, just to put some numbers to the, 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 uh, the amounts. Yeah. Cool. A uh, quick question from uh, from FDK. Uh, he can't talk right now; his mic's not working. But he DM me. He asked, um, 
what you're uh, seeing with ETH profitability yeah, profitability um, from ETH staking, Titan. ETH profitability from ETH staking. Um, yeah, like what is the profitability like? Is it worth it? Five percent. It? It's like four or five percent. So right, I think we talked about this in one of the recent calls too. Yeah, it's about four to five percent. It's great. It's wonderful. It's uh, I was listening to a recent uh, podcast, uh, the Chopping Block. It's like one of my favorite ones. I can't wait for them to come out every week. Yeah, and uh, Tarun was basically like, "Yeah, ETH staking is basically the most organic yield there is in uh, in crypto," and um, it was a really funny term because it was like organic yield. Like, what the hell does that even mean? But uh, you know, there's yield everywhere, and lots of it has lots of risk and DeFi farming and all these kinds of things, counterparty risk and and uh, blah blah blah. And uh, yeah, ETH staking is basically just like four to five percent, and like. You have almost no counterparty risk if you're ho- uh, home staking. Um, and um, the slashing, you really don't have to worry about much. You only get slashed for three times the amount of your stake as a maximum slash as a percentage of the entire network for certain things. Um, or that's the, yeah. Anyway, there's, there's a lot to it, but... Um, yeah, home staking is great. If you've got a machine that can already do it, which uh, many machines can. Um, some people do it on a Raspberry Pi, although I wouldn't recommend it. I'd recommend getting a decent machine. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, it's super fun to be a part of that community too because it's kind of big and fun and smart people and very positive. So, Awesome. I highly recommend it. Hopefully that answers your question for Kudzman. Okay. Sure, he's nodding. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thanks. There you go. Okay, any other questions uh, before we head out? Right on. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us for this week's Water Cooler Chat. Uh, Appreciate you all being here. And uh, keep it going during the bear market. And uh, yeah, keep on keeping on. It's great. We Peace, will guys. see you all next week. Cheers. Peace. Thank you, bye. Bye, everyone. Uh, bye.